In the post-October 7th Israeli reality, is any new security threat really outside the realm of imagination? In a week in which over 300 projectiles were sent from Iran to Israel, I, Amanda Borchel Dan, posed this question to journalist and founder co-creator Avi Isakharov. Legions of fans around the world know of Avi's fiction writing from the popular television series that is loosely based on his experiences in the IDF's elite Duvdivan unit. It's written alongside Fauda star Leo Raz, and you'll hear a little story of their real-life bravery during our conversation. But Avi is a diehard journalist and analyst of the Arab world who has put his life on the line in the past to cover a story. So this week, I pick his brain as we unpick the naughty situation Israel is currently facing with enemies on all of our borders and Iran as a puppet master who is coming increasingly closer to a nuclear bomb. So this week, I, Amanda Borchel Dan, ask journalist Avi Isharov, what matters now? Avi, thank you so much for joining me today for What Matters Now, our weekly podcast from the Times of Israel. Thank you, Amanda. Do you, you remember, you probably don't, the last time we spoke? No. It was October 7th at about four o'clock in the afternoon. Wow. Yeah, big, big day. And at that point, you were saying that the Hamas infiltration was on the level of 9-11 for the United States. Would you agree with that statement now? It's pretty surprising to me even to hear that this is what I said at 4 p.m. on October 7th, Saturday, because I was sure that till now, really, till that second, I wasn't sure that at that point at 4 p.m. that I really understood the scale of the attack. And now I understand that I did. And I have to thanks Al Jazeera for helping me understanding that, meaning Al Jazeera that became a propaganda tool for Hamas, military wing, political wing, just aired everything, including everything starting from 7 a.m. in the morning. And suddenly you could see it on your screen. You could see the uh, part of the atrocities that they didn't show the atrocities, the real atrocities, but you could see the way that they went into the kibbutz, the towns, and kill people and took over parts of those uh, of those places, and you understood that there are many many casualties and hostages uh, during this attack. During our conversation, we still had no clear idea about the numbers of people who were killed or abducted. Of course, those numbers shifted. But at that point, you had an idea that this was a turning point in the history of Israel for sure. And I know that a couple of days later, you went into Sterot yourself. You went in with your writing partner, your Fauda partner, and with uh, Yochanan Plesner, who was the head of the Israel uh, Democracy Institute, and tried to evacuate some families. Tell us very briefly what you saw on that day. So, just like many other Israelis, I was kind of very much uh, frustrated from the not only the situation, but also the fact that I couldn't do much. I mean, I crossed the 50 not that too long time ago, but I crossed the 50 and my military unit in the reserves in the Miluim didn't call me. And I was almost begging them to take me, but they didn't. So I was looking to do something. And I've heard that Achim Laneshek, Brothers and Sisters in Arms, opened up a kind of an operation room uh, not far from Sderot in Bet Kama. And from there, they're trying to help people that are living in Gaza's periphery, including Sderot, to, to get them out of the danger zone because Gaza's periphery was still under fire and there were some terrorists on the streets and the fields of Gaza's periphery. And this is what brothers and sisters in arms did, meaning go into those towns and villages, bring the people out of the war zone or the danger zone and try to, to bring them to safe zone as fast as possible. So I joined them at around 2 p.m., in Bet Kama, and I remember that when I entered the kibbutz, I was kind of shocked. I was kind of shocked because I saw hundreds of Israelis, more or less my age, again, people that could not go to the army, that were there waiting in line to get a mission, 
what was the mission? You know, you get a name, you get a phone number of someone that is stuck in Sderot, let's say, and you need to pick him up and bring them out of Sderot. And those men were standing in line just like, you know, I don't know, waiting in line for coffee or for something very tasty in the streets of New York and waiting to get a mission that would put their own life in danger in order to help people that they don't know, that they don't have any idea who they are, but just in in order to help them. And, you know, you say, Kol Yisrael arevim zelaze, meaning we're all responsible for each other. And this is the feeling that I got when I saw the, the, this amazing thing. And, you know, this is... This was a kind of a ray of light in the total darkness of what happened these days, that days, in Gaza's periphery and in the war against Hamas. And at the end, when I looked around and I saw all those faces around me, I couldn't feel but some kind of optimism that at the end of the day, we will prevail, we will manage to stand on our feet and to win this war. And I must say that, you know, we got into Sderot, and I remember the first family that we picked up, a mother and two kids, and she's a new Ola uh, from Caucasia, from Georgia. Um, and she said, she, she, she was trying to ask what, what, what was happening, who were we, because she didn't recognize I was with someone that I didn't know that we went on, on my car to pick them up and it was shooting around us and there were rockets falling and every couple of, of minutes you hear the Tseva Adon, Tseva Adon, the red color, red color, and you need to hide. And then she was asking, who were you guys? And I said, brothers and sisters in arms. And she said, well, 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 she was afraid that we might be Hamas. But then she understood that we were volunteers and she said, you know, I'm not such a smart woman. That was her own words. I'm not that sophisticated. I'm a new Ola from Georgia. But I do understand that it wasn't you that was supposed to pick me up. It was supposed to be the government. And, you know, she was crying. She was really, really crying. It was really hard for me even to, to be there. And the second round, I went with Leo and Yohanan to another family, and we call them, it was a mother and her daughter, and they got out of the house, and it was darkness already, and still rockets are falling and shooting in the street. And then she stepped out, and suddenly I hear the daughter saying, oh my God, it's the Ron from Fauda. <laughs> and that was it. I mean, no more shooting of rockets and no more shooting in the streets. She wanted a selfie with Leo Raz Duron from Fauda. Shortly after the Hamas infiltration, you said in several interviews that you had considered such or a similar plot line in the newest season of Fauda and dismissed it because it just seemed too over the top. But obviously, reality is stranger than fiction often. And would you have ever in your wildest imagination have thought that Iran would send over 300 projectiles from Iran to Israel in one night? Well, yes, about Iran, yes. I didn't think that it would be following the assassination of Brigadier General and the Revolutionary Guards who was planning some attacks against Israel. I thought that if we're going to face some kind of uh, scenario like that, it would be after a major attack on Iranian nuclear facilities in Iran or a war, a complete war with Hezbollah. At the end of the day, you know, the, the so-called excuse that the Iranians decided to retaliate, so-called, and again, I don't think that this is retaliation. This is a kind of an attempt to create a new equation between Israel, Iran, Syria, and Hezbollah. At the end, I would like to remind the audience that the Israeli attack was not on the Iranian embassy, but a, a building that was adjacent to the Iranian embassy in Damascus. And over there, there was a group of Iranian generals that I can call them easily terrorists, that they were planning how to commit attacks against Israel from Syria and Lebanon. 
The man that was killed that attack, General Mahadevi, was in charge of the Revolutionary Guards forces in Syria and Lebanon that were 24-7 hours occupied with how to kill more Israelis. So was it a kind of a, I don't know, a drama? No, this was part of the war between Iran and Israel. Did we bomb the Iranian embassy? No, although the Iranians, and I would like to remind you that, did bomb and try to bomb some Israeli embassies all over the world, starting with Argentina, of course, Buenos Aires, 1992, but then they tried to do it in Baku, Azerbaijan, they tried to do it in Canada, they tried to do it in Thailand, they tried to do it in so many places. And suddenly, oh my God, they're attacking a building adjacent to the, the Iranian embassy. So first of all, you know, I don't buy this, that this was a retaliation. That was a clear attempt to, to send an, an Israel a message. Now, if you're going to attack one of us in Syria, we're going to attack with drones and with cruise missiles. And I, th I think that Israel have to continue and, claim, and send a message that no Iranian general that is operating or working in killing of Israelis will be safe in any territory, not in Syria, no Iran, not Lebanon. Simple as that. So the retaliation by Iran was a scary moment, shall we say, for Israel, but Israel definitely stepped up over overwhelmingly some 99% of the projectiles that were sent were were shot down also by neighboring countries, also by the United States, also by Britain, also by France. But it sounds to me that these neighboring countries and Britain and France and uh, the United States would not have our back if we were to continue to knock off the generals and get this kind of response back from Iran. But now everyone is signaling, hey, that's enough, Israel. Like, step down. Don't do anything crazy now. Don't do something crazy in Iran. This is what they do mean. I don't think that they are trying to say don't protect yourself by going and attacking people that are planning to go and kill you. I mean, it's a, it's a kind of a crazy situation. Even by them saying to us, don't go and attack Iran, it's, it's ridiculous if you ask me because no other country in the world would ignore that and just continue with its daily routine unless it's Israel that is under an a huge pressure from all over not to, to retaliate. But having said that, we have to keep in mind that the Iranians are still continuing to plan attacks from Syria, Lebanon, Yemen, Iraq, Iran, wherever, the West Bank and Gaza against Israel. And we cannot ignore that. And we cannot allow the international community to ignore that. They have to understand that the real bad guy here is not even Hezbollah. It's not even Hamas. It's the Iranians. And without taking care of the real problem, we're all going to meet this problem, Not maybe not in six hours or six days, but in six months. And it's not going to be only an Israeli problem. It's going to be also the West problem. And they know that by now. You and I see the web that connects all of them together, but it's very difficult, I think, for a regular reader of uh, any kind of international media to understand the connection. When we spoke on October 7th, actually, it was still unclear whether Hezbollah would join in. And what you said at that point was actually, if they do, they're very stupid, but this could be an opportunity to get rid of Hamas and Hezbollah. In the meantime, they have joined in, and yet Israel has not taken steps to really get rid of Hezbollah. They did, and they didn't. Like, Hezbollah is very careful about what it is doing from Lebanon. Even during the last attack of the Iranians, they didn't join the Iranian attack. So yes, they are bombing the northern area, but they do not cross that line of the north area. Why? Because they don't want war. It's a kind of a lip service, so-called, which includes, of course, rockets and, and killing people, etc. But we have more than 350 Hezbollah members that were killed in Lebanon till now. I mean, they are paying a very heavy price for their involvement. And still, let's keep in mind that in the last six months plus, they send a very clear message 
we don't want a full-scale war. We need to show Hamas and the Arab world that we are doing something, but we don't want more than that. A lot of this is very performative, meaning what's happening with Hezbollah and, and potentially perhaps what Iran sent over just does kind of seem like flexing of muscles in a way. But do you think that Israel is flexing enough back? Definitely not in the case of Iran till now. And we are talking on April 17th at 1.44 p.m. So I don't know if it's going to be relevant for tonight or for tomorrow. Till now, the Israelis are ignoring, in a way, uh, the Iranian attack. Again, I'm not sure that this is going to be relevant in a couple of days. Hezbollah, there is a clear decision by the Israeli government and by the Israeli security apparatus you know, not to cross the line over there too. Meaning, first of all, we need to focus on Gaza. Later on, after we'll manage to get over the, all the obstacles and all the problems in Gaza, so maybe we can focus more about Lebanon. Till then, we're going to continue in this kind of uh, war of attrition with Hezbollah. And we are hitting them pretty hard, I must say, from the air, and sometimes not even from the air, but mainly from the air. And we are killing commanders in Hezbollah, high rank officers, etc. Iran is closer than ever to a nuclear weapon, and it's possible that its leadership is closer than ever to being crazy enough to use it. There is a recent Washington Post report that it could be a matter of days until they reach enough fuel, and it could be something like six months until they reach the actual bomb. Do you see this as something that we Israelis should be existentially aware of and afraid of? I think that this is the biggest threat for the state of Israel. I mean, with all the respect to Hamas and Hezbollah, and there's not much respect, it's not an existential threat for the state of Israel. I think that what is happening, according to the Washington Post and the IAEA, it's a matter of days, like you said, till they will get enough enriched uranium for three nuclear bombs. And we're talking about military level of enriched uranium of 90%. It's crazy. It's way beyond crazy because 12 years ago, when we had Benjamin Netanyahu speaking in the UN about the threat of Iranian nuclear bomb and showing this uh, paint of a comics of a bomb, and he showed the red line that we cannot allow Iran to get there, we are there. We are there on the red line and Iran is just days from crossing it. And still, Israel and the whole world are focusing on Gaza, Lebanon, and of course, some cruise missiles that were sent from Iran. At the end of the day, the nuclear facility in Fordu and Boucher and other places are way more threatening to us than any rocket that will be shot or not shot from Gaza or from Lebanon. And this is the main thing that we have to keep in mind. And if you ask me, this is the biggest failure of the Israeli leadership of the last 14 years, of the last 15 years, since Benjamin Netanyahu won the elections and became the prime minister. His main issue was about Iran, 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 prevent Iran from becoming nuclear. Now it is becoming nuclear and Israel is not doing anything in order to stop it. Avi, you and I are kind of of an age. I'm 48, you're a bit north of 50. And I grew up in North America where the threat of nuclear war seemed very imminent. It seemed like it could happen any single day. We went in school, we had drills where we had to go under the desk and put our hands over our head to ward off nuclear fallout. And I think uh, many uh, people have grown up with this Iran as the big bad guy. Iran will attack, Iran will attack. And so now it's kind of here and people don't even want to absorb that it is an actual possibility. You know, it's a kind of a thing that you cannot really deal with. You know, all the time that you have Hamas and Hezbollah, you're saying to yourself, okay, we can deal with them. We're stronger. The fact that 
Iran will have a nuclear bomb. This is something that, you know, you cannot really deal with. I mean, how can you live in the state of Israel when you know that every second there might be a nuclear bomb that will annihilate the state of Israel, demolish it? We cannot, it's not like in the case of the US or, or Russia that if a one bomb or two bombs or even three nuclear bombs will fall, still the US or Russia will survive. This is not the case. So this is something that we cannot allow. And th maybe this is why, from the psychological point of view, many people here in Israel tend to forget that. Keeping in mind, of course, that you know we have some other issues to deal with, like Gaza, like Lebanon. Hamas did what it did on October 7th, and all of us woke up to this nightmare and understood that we created a monster. We helped in creating a monster on our southern border. I always wonder really how interconnected the different groups are, Hamas, Hezbollah, Iran, because some part of my brain is wondering if all of this isn't a distraction to take our attention away from this nuclear threat, just like in the beginning of October, there was a lot of activity along the border. We thought it was just uh, Hamas again having some kind of protest, which they've done in the past. I think it was July, large-scale protest, but really it was to divert our attention away from this. Do you see any kind of overarching, I don't I don't want to call it conspiracy theory, but overarching control over all of these narratives to make this nuclear uh, bomb a reality for Iran? I don't think that they planned Gaza. I don't think that they were involved in, you know, picking up the date for the Hamas attack. And it's pretty clear that they didn't know about that. I mean, we know for sure from Israeli intelligence that they weren't in the picture. It's not that Hamas coordinated with them the schedule, when shall we start, when will we end, blah, blah, blah. At the end of the day, the Iranians are enjoying the fruits of October 7th, meaning that the whole world is now attacking Israel for attacking Hamas, for attacking Israel. The whole world is dealing now with the crisis over the border with Lebanon, and even now, okay, again, dealing with the cruise missiles and the drones. And the whole world is ignoring the nuclear facilities, and the fact that they are running like crazy towards a nuclear bomb. And it's very convenient for them, and it's great for them, and they wish that this situation will continue. At some point, the Israeli government will have to wake up, and instead of you know discussing how bad the opposition is, and blaming the Kaplans, and blaming his brothers and sisters in arms for the situation right now, they should focus on the real enemy, and this is Iran. Iran is definitely a destabilizing force in, for example, the West Bank as well. It's not as if Iran isn't triggering other problems, <laughs> regardless of the different groups that it's funding. How do you see the Jewish extremists in the West Bank being connected to Iran in a way, in a counterintuitive way? I think that the Jewish extremists in the West Bank are just helping Hamas, Iran, Hezbollah to destabilize the situation, to destabilize the West Bank. And in, in at the end of the day, they're trying, they're really trying, I don't know if they're aware of that or not, but they are bringing an escalation as a real option that will take place in every single minute. Because every time that they go and, I don't know, burn a car or try to kill a Palestinian, what they're doing is they're helping the people that are trying to destabilize the West Bank, meaning Hamas and Iran. And this is what they're doing. Now, they are terrorists, if you ask me. The ones that are killing innocent Palestinians are terrorists. The ones that are burning houses and cars a Jewish terrorist, simple as that. And this state, this government has to wake up also about them. Because right now they have some friends in the Israeli government, meaning Bezalel Smotrich, Itamar Ben-Gvir, that not only ignoring them, but in a way Ben-Gvir even helping them, but not investigating the people that are suspects of, you know, committing those crimes. So there's a kind of a double foul here. First of all, they're taking parts in terrorist attacks against civilians. And number two, they are helping Iran and Hamas. 
the Palestinian Authority is not very effective in cracking down on the violence in the West Bank. And indeed, the IDF is in the West Bank, probably more than it has been in, I don't know, even decades. I'm not sure. You tell me. But I wonder how you see the Palestinian Authority, which again, does not seem to be very strong in the West Bank. How do you see them involved in the day after in the Gaza Strip in rehabilitating the people and the leadership there? So it's pretty interesting to see what is happening to the Palestinian Authority, because I think that what Hamas did on October 7th is wasn't only against Israel, it was also against the Palestinian Authority. That was a kind of a message to the Palestinian public, we're the decision makers, we don't care about the Palestinian Authority, and we will decide upon the agenda and the, the targets of the Palestinian people. And they did. And you saw, according to the polls, the huge support that they got from the public, the Palestinian public, for the atrocities of October 7th, although most of the public said there were no atrocities, but they supported October 7th. Anyway, the Palestinian Authority is right now the weakest in the situation ever, meaning it is in the weakest situation ever since its foundation at 1994. You know, 1994, this is when they came to Jericho in Gaza after September 1993, the, the Oslo agreements, of course. So we're talking about 30 years since the foundation of the Palestinian Authority in Jericho and Gaza. And right now we are talking about a very weak and corrupt Palestinian Authority. They support, in a way, the families of the terrorists. They pay them salaries. Their books, educational books, the textbooks that are learned in the, high, in the schools and high schools have some very anti-Israel and anti-Semitic elements in it. And all this gives you a kind of uh, an impression that there's no one to deal with on the Palestinian side. But I want to tell you something. Having said that, after all that I said about the Palestinian Authority, this is the only option that the state of Israel has right now for the day after in Gaza. So even though they corrupt, even though they pay the salaries of the terrorists, they are still collaborating with us in the West Bank. They're still arresting members of Hamas and Islamic Jihad and prevent terrorist attacks from taking place from the West Bank. They are still very strong in some of the areas of the West Bank. And this is the only option that we have for the day after. Why? Because the other options are way worse. So it's not that I suddenly like them and, oh, amazing, great, they are so wonderful. No. But they are the less worse option, and that leaves us with the only option that is relevant on the table. Are they capable of taking the sovereignty of Gaza right now? The answer is no. But we will need to collaborate with them in order to prepare for the day after, because we can continue and fight Hamas forever and ever, and it will not lead us to anything except for looking for a solution for the day after. And all the time that we ignore them, we will not find a solution. We have here a real opportunity to create not only a change in Gaza Strip, but a change in all over the Middle East, because collaborating with the PA by dismantling, not by removing Hamas's regime in Gaza, that will allow us to go for all kinds of peace agreements with Saudi Arabia and other Arab states in the region and create a real drama a real tragedy for Iran. Avi, have you yourself been in Gaza during this war? Yes, I've been a couple of times. What are you seeing there? Especially, are you able to speak with any of the Gazans who are there? No, no. Actually, I, I was embedded with the troops. There were no Palestinians in the areas of the uh, of the war, of the fighting, meaning I was in Shaja'iya during the days of the battle over Shaja'iya. I didn't see any civilians at all. There were, I, I was in uh, Khan Yunis area during the Battle of Khan Yunis. No civilians at all. What you see is crazy scale of demolished houses, like roads, neighborhoods, houses all over the place. You don't see people, you don't see animals. And this is Gaza. So in Gaza, you used to see lots of animals whether it was sheep or donkeys or horses or camels or cows or whatever, nothing, nada. It's like getting into, I don't know, a, 
a second world war zone that you see in the movies and even worse than that and it's very sad and it's very tragic but at the end of the day we need to keep in mind why did it all happen it wasn't about israel israel didn't want this war israel was forced to go into this war on october 7th and the way that hamas is using and was using their own population their own palestinian population in order to get cover from the israeli retaliation or attacks this is what led to this catastrophe in gaza and i, I and i have to be clear about that because you know i hear so many people blaming israel for genocide and for um transferring of palestinians this is not the case okay there's no genocide if israel wanted to kill all the palestinians it would have done it in a few days it's not interested israel is not interested in genocide israel is not interested in transferring any palestinian but in order to save the lives of the palestinians we ask them to go south okay so how can you blame someone at the same time of you know genocide and transferring while they're transferring some of the people in order to save their lives so please you know even if you're an israeli critic and you hate the state of israel and you hate jews please stop talk about okay you are trying to mobilize people towards south why in order to save people's lives and there are more and more myths like that you know the the siege over over gaza the so-called siege till october 7th how come that there was a siege and i had people from gaza working outside my house here in tel aviv what kind of a siege is that please explain to me if people wanted to leave gaza they they've done it and could have done it through rafah checkpoint through egypt so why creating all those lies and myths and at the end of the day justifying a terrorist attack that shouldn't have been done on October 7th and brought to a real Palestinian catastrophe or Nakba? Avi, we began our conversation talking about how you thought that this kind of scenario was over the top for Fauda. And I wonder how the reality of the situation is affecting future Fauda episodes. I think that it's... It affects not only Fauda, it affects all the, also other shows, other movies. I think that, you know, at the end of the day, when you deal with Israeli shows that are in a kind of a dialogue with their reality, you cannot ignore October 7th. October 7th, just think about, you know, the, the same thing that I told you back then on October 7th. Just imagine 9-11 and then double it three or double it four. This is the scale of the... Of the event that we've seen and met and witnessed on our flesh and bones that day so this is something that cannot be ignored not in literature not in movies not in anything that deals with art and as an israeli writer an artist a creator i have to say you know that there's a there's a wound in my heart also that i cannot ignore i cannot just continue and create shows that will not deal in some way or the other with october 7th avi thank you for sharing your insights with me today thank you very much manda thanks for listening to what matters now the times of israel's weekly deep dive conversation podcast If you have any questions or comments about this or any other episode, please drop us an email to podcast at timesofisrael.com. This episode was produced by The Podwaves. Until next week, Shalom. Shalom.